There's a global architecture firm on a mission of sustainability to help make the world a better place, one design at a time. Let's join Mike Wunsch to learn more. Steve, give us a little back history of BNIM. Did BNIM react to the environment in which you work, or did you change the environment in which you work? You know, uh, your dad was an architect, I know that, and I knew him a little bit, but uh, and his, he had a, quite an imprint on Kansas City. The firm was really a Kansas City-focused practice until about 20 years ago. One of the great things about BNIM is we're taking the things that we learned in Kansas City and helping people in California, or helping people in Texas, or, you know, more recently, helping people in Africa. And, you know, that we've learned really good lessons here about responsibility, about innovation, about the opportunities to make the world a better place through design. So my name is Jeremy Knoll, and I co-lead the sustainability team at BNIM, and what that team consists of is individuals and members who are advocates for sustainable building methods, who ask the hard questions of our projects teams, uh, and, and ultimately then report back at the end of the year so that we're collecting all of the information from projects across the firm, whether it's a tiny little coffee shop renovation or a multi-billion dollar 10 year long uh, master plan development. We're looking at every single project we touch. You know, for a lot of people, we hear the term sustainability, but in, return, in terms of buildings or architecture, what does that specifically mean? What things are you impacting? Well, each building really has uh, so much potential to impact our lives and our health and our you know, overall well being uh, in a pretty positive way. At BNAM, really the root of our work is thinking about design in a holistic, interconnected way. So when we think about sustainability, we're not just thinking just about energy efficiency. We're thinking about um, multiple categories. And actually, we track metrics on all of our projects in six categories. So it's energy, water, ecology, wellness, equity, and resources. And so there are a number of factors from daylight to thermal comfort to you know the carbon associated with the project that we're, we're taking all of that into consideration whenever we're creating a design for our clients. Buildings impact our lives every single day. It is the environment in which we live our life. Obviously it plays a major role. A lot has to go into how buildings are designed. The environments we're in, you know, I don't think people realize how much they're impacting their physical, their psychological, their emotional well-being. Um, and that's really our job is to make sure that we're designing spaces to you know, help with human experience to, you know, help people um, thrive. Can you explain how what you guys do today has a very long impact? We start looking at the way buildings use energy um, really from over a, a, the lifetime of a building. So it, a small decision now where we say, you know, it may use 5% more energy if we cut this piece of uh, advanced technology. That doesn't really sound like a whole lot of additional energy in a year, but when you multiply that over 100 years of lifetime and then extrapolate out how much carbon is associated with that and then multiply that out on how many buildings we're doing every year, uh, it, it exponentially can get worse and worse if we're not really paying attention to those details. There's so many older, beautiful buildings in our country and across the world that when possible to restore and keep those buildings, is that a sustainable approach to try to preserve and keep older structures and re rebuild them? It certainly is. Um, in fact, it's one of the most sustainable things that you can do um, in, in design right now. Because it's there already, all the energy that was created to make the materials and construct that building is, is has already occurred and so to reuse it you're not going to have to do that again if it was a new building. So by the time you've saved the structure and what we call the envelope of a building you've saved close to 80 percent of the embodied energy of that building. It takes a lot of materials and it takes a lot of energy to build a building. Everything from extracting uh, metal from the earth to processing that, shipping it, processing it again, 
then installing it with an arc welder that's going to use a lot of energy. By the time you have a beam in a building, it's used an enormous amount of energy. So that's what we call embodied energy. There's an embodied energy in a, in a building that is intrinsic to the, uh, to the building materials. So if you're doing a gut renovation um, compared to building new, you can save 80% of that energy before you've even started by choosing to renovate rather than build new. Plus, I mean, a lot of these structures, especially if they're historic in nature, they have a great quality and character that today we, you know, we just can't replicate some of that beautiful terracotta or brickwork um, anymore. Share with us the challenges climate change has brought on. It seems storms are bigger, storms are more intense. Mm -hmm. In the world of architecture, how has that impacted what you guys are doing? The changing climate around us has impacted the way that we design in that we now have to think about disasters not as an, as an if, but a when. We have to plan on flooding. We have to plan on tornadoes. We have to assume that those things are going to happen. And not only are they going to happen, but they're going to happen in, with increasing frequency. I'm actually working on a project um, in Northwest Africa and you know, it's in a place where the Sahara Desert meets the Atlantic Ocean and they have a number of climate issues. They have advancing desert, they have rising sea levels. Whenever we design for a project in a place like that, we're thinking about the ways in which our building can extend beyond its walls. How can it help that kind of local city and what, in what ways can it do that? So for example, in this place, um, they have issues with um, flooding even though it's in the desert, and stormwater. And so we're making sure that on our project, we're not doing anything worse to cause problems in terms of that flooding. We're thinking about the winds that come through and how we can create a microclimate on that place. So it's about thinking about that, the specifics of that place, of its climate, to benefit beyond the walls of the building. One thing that's obviously happening with climate change is storms are more intense. Tornadoes, floods, floods where we didn't used to have floods, etc. How does that all impact your design decisions? Well, you know, when you have a big catastrophic event, like we like in Greensburg, Kansas, for instance, the, the whole town was wiped out. And so we had to go back and, and build new. It gives an opportunity to build new um, in a better way. BNIM was, was brought in um, to first engage with um, public officials to, to answer some of those questions and to think broadly about what, what would rebuilding this town take, what, what is involved. Um, but really where, where our role really began was in, uh, in, was in meeting with the community that had been dispersed and trying to get a handle on how do we go about rebuilding or reimagining what this place can be? What's important about Greensburg is the, the value system of the people led the redevelopment of the city after the disaster and have continued on. They could, you could do things the easy way or you could do things the right way. And they tended to always choose to, the right way. Is it fair to say too, what happened in Greensburg really became a national example of sustainable architecture. And so Greensburg definitely became uh, an example for the rest of the nation. It did have a spotlight shone on it uh, during both during the recovery and then to some degree afterwards. What I found the most exciting about the process of, of the recovery of Greensburg, Kansas was that the high school students began to attend uh, the Green Building Conferences. The, the kids got together and convinced their parents that they could make an, a city, and the words they use, make a place that we want to come back to. So they invested in, you know, technology, you know, high-speed internet. The city adopted a LEED Platinum ordinance, so all the public buildings are LEED Platinum. They've got a, you know, their own energy plant, renewable energy plant, wind plant. There's water, smart water ma management strategies on Main Street, right through downtown, as well as throughout the town. And, you know, it's just they, they decided to do things the right way because they knew that was, that was ingrained in their value system. We live in a world where electric cars are becoming more common. Many, many things are changing. Our resources are limited. How do you see the balance moving forward as an architecture firm 
dealing with resources, dealing with the limitations. I'm already talking on most projects that we go after, um, that we pursue as an architecture firm, about using no energy during the operation of the building. That's already part of what, that's already part of the conversation. Um, so the next frontier for us is really all about figuring out the embodied emissions when we, when we build a building, we build it with a lot of different materials, but concrete and steel stand out as two of the materials that use the most energy to, to create, to ship. They're heavy, they're, they take a lot of effort to take out of the earth, to melt, to put back together, to combine with other materials, um, and then eventually to, to make into a building or a bridge or a road. So from an architect's perspective, those are two materials that are very fundamental to the way that we do business. So rather than trying to solve everything all the time, uh, what we're seeing is that if we can begin to really focus on the, on the big pieces and get those to where we're starting to make, make real industry changes to those types of materials and bring the emissions of those down, um, then we've got the beginnings of some, some real change and some real solutions. In regards to your team, your sustainability team, where do you see you guys going in the future to continually improve on what you're doing? I'm really looking forward to pushing our team of architects to reduce our impact even further and start to even get into the realm of positive buildings that they don't affect the environment in a negative way but they give back they they have some sort of regenerative aspect to the building you know looking towards a more regenerative future to to try and reduce some of the damage that's already been done i think that's the next step in architecture is moving in that direction you know it's our duty to protect the health safety and welfare of our society and community um, so, and it's actually part of our code of ethics to think about sustainability in the design of projects. And I think, you know, one of the, the biggest challenges architects are facing right now is how to address climate change in the work that we do. Um, because buildings, you know, consume, you know, about 45% of U.S. global emissions, um, really architects have been called to action to, to be part of this, you know, solving the problem. I was in school in the 70s. That means I've been practicing a little over 40 years. At some point, we have to just say enough is enough. We have to start making better decisions about how we occupy the land and the kinds of environments that we build, what, uh, how the systems that we use to, to build those uh, buildings. And that means thinking, you know, re the construction, well, we have to rethink the construction industry. So somehow or another, we have to change the way that we're designing and fabricating buildings so that we're using less embodied carbon, less energy, less resources in the construction process, and we're having less impact, long-term impact, over that 50 or 100 year cycle of the building on the, the natural systems that uh, are, de are being degraded. You know, we are at this point where we have to change the way we're doing things in order to peacefully coexist uh, with the systems that got here first.